Hey guys, I'm Mr. Hutton. Um, it's nice following the students here because the context in which I know uh, Andrew Hudgens is as his I was uh, lucky enough to be able to study with him two summers ago at the Suwannee School of Letters where he's been teaching for years. Um, before I took the class, I, I found that he was somewhat of a legend already in this program. And I was told, um, beware of Andrew Hudgens because he'll tear your poetry to shreds. And uh, this I found intriguing. And I discovered something. I discovered that what that meant by tearing it to shreds was that he cared enough about your poetry and about poetry as a craft that he was willing to be blunt and very carefully critique your work. Um, and I discovered that uh, in addition to his reputation as being a fairly risk-taking, daring, sometimes off-color poet, he also had this immense attention to craft and poetics and the kind of stuff that we do here. So I, I said, we, we've got to get uh, Andrew Hudgens to MBA, and, and he was willing to, so I'm really delighted that he's here. Um, he's very much a Southern poet. Uh, he grew up in Alabama, went to Huntington College and University of Alabama, um, and then got accepted to the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop, where countless great writers have uh, attended. And his poetry got quickly noticed for its dark humor, its Southern Gothic components, um, but also this sense of real precision and poetics. Uh, traditional concerns. Um, he was nominated for the Pulitzer, for the National Book Award. He's been anthologized widely, taught in high schools, colleges, um, and will continue to be, and hopefully increasingly so. Um, he's currently finishing his fine year, final year teaching at Ohio State. Um, he will be retiring this summer and moving full-time to Sewanee here in Tennessee where we'll be able to access his wisdom. Um, so I'm going to turn it over. Please give a good welcome to Andrew Hudgens. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you guys for reading. Uh, it's a pleasure to um, get to know your work. And um, I'll get you out of here in time for dinner. We, um, I'm going to start with a poem simply called In. It involved running behind the fog truck when I was a kid and not realizing until much later that the, what we called the fog truck was in fact spraying DDT, poison, so we were running in the poison. When we first heard from blocks away the fog truck's blustery roar, we dropped our toys, leapt from our meals, and scrambled out the door into an evening briefly fuzzy. We yearn to be transformed, translated past confining flesh to disembodied spirit. We swarmed in thick smoke, taking human form, before we blurred again, turned vague and then invisible in temporary heaven. Freed of bodies by the fog, we sang, we laughed, we shouted, we were our voices, nothing else. Voice was all we wanted. The white clouds tumbled down our streets, pursued by spellbound children who chased the most distorting clouds, ecstatic in the poison. Everybody thought DDT was safe then. Now it turns out, not so much. Uh, um, the title of this poem is The Cadillac in the Attic. Um, I was reading a little study by one of my instructors, of one of my instructors, Donald Justice. Don was um, raised in um, Miami, and um, he um, told somebody the story about somebody who had rented an upstairs apartment. The upstairs apartment had access to the attic. And this guy, while he had that apartment, 
smuggled in parts of a car up into his apartment, then up into the attic and literally built and left there for the landlord to find a Cadillac in the attic. And I thought, it just sounds cool to say that, the Cadillac in the attic. And also, you wanted to think about that a little bit. Why would somebody do something like that? And as soon as you ask the question, you kind of know the answer. The Cadillac in the attic. After the tenant moved out, died, disappeared, the stories vary. The landlord walked downstairs, bemused, and told his wife, there's a Cadillac in the attic, and there was. An old one, sure, and one with sloppy paint, bald tires, and orange rust chewing at the rocker panels, but still in all, a Cadillac in the attic. He battled transmission, chassis, engine block, even the huge bench seats, up the folding stairs, heaved them through the trap door, and rebuilt a Cadillac in the attic. Why'd he do it, we asked. But we know why. For the reasons we would do it. For the looks of astonishment he'd never see, but could imagine. For the joke, a Cadillac in the attic. And for the meaning though we aren't sure what it means. And of course, he did it for pleasure. The pleasure on his lips of all those short vowels and three hard clicks, the Cadillac in the attic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to read a poem, since we talked about this in a couple of the sessions today. It's a poem I don't usually read. It's called Southern Literature. Um, I had a job, I don't know, I was um, probably 28 years old and in between work, and one of the teachers at my former school in Montgomery um, had, um, she needed somebody to drive her around, and um, she, um, I think I made six dollars every time I drove her to um, basically um, the nursing home to visit her friends, the grocery store, and most of important of all, the liquor store. And because uh, she went through about a handle of um, vodka a week, the um, the um, but she had been the wife of Phil. What was his name? It's dropped out of my head. I think it's Snow. He was um, one of Faulkner's best friends, um, and um, she, um, she was a competitive woman. Um, the poem's called Southern Literature. She hunched in the back seat and fired one lucky off the one before. We talked about her good friend Bill. No one wrote like Bill anymore. When the silence grew uncomfortable, she'd count out my six rumpled ones and ask, noblesse oblige, how are your literary lucubrations progressing? Not good, I'd snarl. My poems were going nowhere like me, raw 28, and having, she said, a worm's eye view of life and awe. I had no sense of awe, but once I lied. Terrific, the Atlantic accepted five. She smiled benignly, composed and gaily fatalistic, as I hammered to win Dixie, revving the slant six till it bucked and sputtered. She smoothed her blue, unwrinkled dress, Bill won the Nobel Prize, she purred. If I laid rubber to the interstate and started speeding, 
How long, I wondered, how long would she scream before she prayed? Would she sing before I murdered her? Would we make Memphis or New Orleans? The world was gorgeous now and bigger. I reached for the gun I didn't own. I chambered awe. I pulled the trigger. I have never killed anyone, just so you know. Um, um, <laughs> but as an act of imagination, many. The, um, I told one of the groups um, today this story. Um, story it's absolutely true. Um, when um, Let me see. I, I here I, um, do I do I say it happened while I was in school? I don't think I did. Um, I actually I pretended I was there, but a year or two after I graduated from Sidley Lanier High School in Montgomery. Um, now, does anybody in this room who's not a teacher know who Sidney Lanier is? I see no hands. The um, Sidney Lanier was a poet. He'd served in the Civil War, moved to Montgomery, got a job working at a hotel downtown town because it was run by his brother, and um, died very young, but he was um, one of the most important early American poets who's been eclipsed now. Um, so now that I've told you that, what do you suppose the name of our athletic team was at Sydney Lanier High? Exactly, the Sydney Lanier Poets. The um, cheerleaders came out to the tune of Hawaii Five-O. Da 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 da. And they would look out, and they would say, "Who are the poets?" And we would shout back, "We are the poets." And then they would say, what kind of poets? And we would shout back, fighting poets. Somebody got it. The, um, this put me off of poetry. The, um, but um, one of our, um, but there was, anyway, this class two years after mine, there was a boy who apparently had made a costume. He'd taken a bunch of pom-poms and stuck them all over, you know, a t-shirt or sweatshirt and sweatpants. And at pep rallies, he would get up on a lunch table and lead cheers. And um, somebody at his table took a kitchen match, put it against the uh, strike plate, and did that. And this kid went up like a torch. And um, the, um, you're laughing now. The, um, um, this is that southern sense of humor we talked about a couple of times today. The, um, yeah, he, um, they, he was in the hospital and they medevaced him to Houston. He lived, I think he was pretty scarred. I don't really know what happened to him, I've lost touch. Um, but he did live. But I sat there thinking about it, you know, that just didn't happen at every high school. I bet it didn't happen in most of yours. The, um, but anyway, um, I wrote a poem about it that I'd kind of forgotten, and this one's called The God of Frenzies. When, some, you know, when things get frenzied and out of control, the ancients talked about it as if there were a, the action of a god, and that something, some demonic god had taken over. The God of Frenzies. The tall boy shook and shimmied across lunch tables, shouting at us to shout. Geez, what a jerk, I thought, but I still shouted. I couldn't stop myself. Strapped to his torso, pinned up and down his legs, blue pom-poms snapped and sizzled. We screamed with him. And as we roared, he rode our screaming, swam in it like water, 
soared. We shook our pom-poms at the living pom-pom and mad, ecstatic, he burst into flame. The boy inside the flames froze one half second as he changed from flesh to fire. He raced across the tables and leapt toward us. I thought it was stagecraft, part of his act. Who would have thought that what looked true was true? I couldn't hear his screams above our screaming. I couldn't see him flopping on the floor. Later, we heard a story, a match flipped at the swirling paper, a joke. Though I know now that I was seeing terror, a boy burning on a table, I remember joy. The boy flung gratefully to his full blazing length onto the air, as if he thought the air would hold him. At that false remembered moment, I saw terror and ecstasy, and I would ask the God of frenzies why, with both choices before him, he chose terror. Though I know there was no reason, he simply chose. slept with a dog, curled up with a dog. The, um, just making the dog take a nap with you. And sometimes the dog wants to do that. And sometimes the dog doesn't. And sometimes you think that you're communing with that dog, that you're understanding something about that other animal more than, you know, that you're understanding what it means like to be something other than yourself, something other than human, even though you know it's only your own imagining. It's a, you can't get outside of it. It's called a sleep with the dog. Curled into my side, tight part of me, she whimpers, twitches, growls, and in her unbroken dream, and my broken one. We bull through sawgrass, blast through burning bramble, murderously fixed on rabbit, not the tossed ball and contemptible stick of this afternoon and the one before and the one after. She shakes the dream prey. She prances with joy, joy in the death work, trembles with it blood joy, can't contain it, cannot contain it, awe. And I dream I tremble her trembling, my brain bright with her fire, her desire mine in my half dream of imperfect and knowable otherness. And if I do not tremble, I can dream it for a moment longer. I can linger for a moment longer in this lie I have loved with my life. It's really, it's really fascinating because we can convince ourselves, I think, that we uh, understand something like an animal and then forget, you know, I mean, how driven by a prey drive, a need, a drive to kill they are. Um, I had a, um, a mutt, a swanee mutt, we found him on the campus and took him home, and he was a squirrel killer, even at the end of his leash, and um, he could um, just, he would, you know, most dogs will try to get a squirrel and they can't do it, and he could. And this, in this poem I was writing, uh, that I just read, the dog was a German wire-haired pointer, and she, she was trained hunting. I mean, she was a hunting dog. She was never trained to hunt. We never hunted with her. But once when she was a puppy, she found a baby rabbit in the yard. 
And she just walked around making that thing squeak until I could finally get it away from her. It was kind of a horrifying moment. But what was interesting also, horrifying for the rabbit, you understand, the dog was perfectly happy, the, um, was just the sheer aliveness of the dog doing that, that terrible, to our, in our perspective, thing. Um, Here's a poem. This is about, um, you know, you watch those shows about starving people in other countries. Um, and you sit, at least I would sit and wonder how to respond. One part of you is hardened. Another part of you is going, you should sell everything you own and give it to the poor as we are told to do in the New Testament. Um, and most of us don't do it. I don't do it. And so I was meditating on that. You'll see, you know, this was written a while ago. You'll see I mentioned Dan Rather. He hasn't been a commentator for um, you know, 15 years now. Poem, but it does take up from the Bible Beatitudes. And I simply call it Beatitudes. Blessed is the Eritrean child, eyes rooting, flies rooting in his eyes for moisture. Blessed the remote control with which I flipped on past. Blessed the flies whose thirst is satisfied. Blessed the parents too weak to brush away the vibrant flies. Blessed the camera crew and blessed the, voca the gravity of Dan Rather, whose voice grows stranger with every death he sees. Blessed my silence and my wife's as we chewed our hot three cheese lasagna. Blessed the comedies we watched that night, the bed we slept in, the work we rose to and completed before we sat once more to supper before the television, a day during which the one child died and many like him. Blessed is the small check we wrote and mailed. Blessed is our horror. <laughs> The, um, there's a phrase in Genesis that tells us that the Lord God walked in the garden in the cool of the evening. And that's a phrase that I've always loved. It's very beautiful. The idea that there was a place where God walked in the garden and he did it in the cool of the evening as if he were subject to the heat of the day. And um, I like that during the times in my life when I've had a garden to go out and just stand in the cool and look at this thing that I've tried to make. And a garden is an odd thing. You don't really make it. You organize it. You do some stuff. But nature itself, or a tamed version of nature, makes it and you kind of tend to it. Um, and yet you're also making decisions. You're deciding which plants get pulled up, which plants get thrown away, which plants get moved to a place where they might do a little better. So in a small way, you are like God as a gardener. And the poem is called In the Cool of the Evening. Among lilies, I am Jehovah, the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening, delighting in every green that grows, sorrowing for those that fail. I am Christ the healer. I pray for black spot and white fly, pluck aphids, and when the leaves turn crisp, I pluck them too and drop them on the ground to soften and return the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening. With books, I am merely the student, 
saying, why, why, why? Exasperating myself and even the long dead with my questions. But among Dianthus, I am the decider. Not here, but there. Not you, but something else. The Lord God walking in the cool of the evening. Beside bellflower, poppy flocks, I keep the night watch. Among lilies, I am the slow mourner for the soft bulb rotting in damp clay. The quiet griever over fire blight in the pyracantha. Fire blight, canker, scale. And when I fail as Christ, I succeed as the adversary, root digger, extirpator, the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening. Beyond branch tips where they scrape the sky, I see the sheets are white, starched, and my skin is yellow, yellow and going gray. Down the row, the Lord God walks in the cool of the evening, delighting, sorrowing, healing, failing to heal. I am very calm. I am almost not afraid. I look neither toward him nor away from him, the Lord God walking in the cool of the evening. Um, one of the things I liked to do um, when I was a kid and I, my parents were at home and I could get away with it was take out the ladder and simply climb to the top of the house and sit there. The, um, did you ever do that? You get that big perspective. You see the neighborhood in a way that you didn't, that you're not used to seeing it. Um, you're, you know, it's a very exciting and interesting thing. And when a hawk would come over, the hawk, you know, you're closer to the hawk because you're up high. And um, I, did you all have that desire? I had the desire when I was a kid, I wanted to fly. I mean, not in an airplane. I simply wanted to fly like a bird. I mean, it was impossible. But I would imagine it. What would it be like to be a hawk? And if you couldn't be a hawk, what would it be like to be a sparrow? Even if a sparrow would live its entire life terrified of hawks. Uh, um, this is called a hawk above the house. The hawk hung low above the house, appraising prey or not prey, not. Then it swung up, veered eastward, gone. That moment, I too ached to open my great imagined wings and arc against the sun's arc, reversing it and following its bright track back through dawns and darkness, till I soared in sunlight above the stucco box I sat on as a boy. And there, I'd fold those gold imagined wings, plummet, and from my father's roof, I'd watch the boy who watched for me. Oh, he'd have given anything to fly, the hawk exploding on the sparrow, or the sparrow frantic threading through the dark green cedars. He'd have given anything to fly, that rapt boy staring at the air, imagining if he could imagine hot thought, deciding no, then knowing it was impossible, a pure extension of himself to wings and cold predation. He tried and failed, but not completely as he had thought. And here I am to tell him so. <laughs> Two poems and we're done. Um, in the book of Job, um, Job is railing at God. 
for all of the terrible things that have happened to him. And God says, can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? A meaning, of course, that he, God, can. And Job has a tiny, small perspective, and he can't. God as bully. Yeah, I can draw up a whale with a fish hook. You can't. Always seem kind of mean, doesn't it? But uh, not that it's wrong, you understand. Um, God is right to insist on his own perspective and his own, um, his own power, his own incomprehensibility. And yet, poor Job has to listen to it. Kind of Behemoth and Leviathan are the two um, characters mentioned in the book of Job. We think of them now as um, the rhinoceros, the behemoth, and Leviathan, the whale, even though they were the monsters of the Bible. Behemoth and Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook? Yahweh sneers. We have drawn out Leviathan, at first with terror, then cheers, then the grunted curse of work. We have hunted him to nothing. We've drawn him with a fish hook, Lord, and then we've stilled his thrashing. We've locked behemoth in a pen for children, and his horn we've ground for an aphrodisiac. We've plucked it like a thorn. Earth shakers wallow in zoo mud, and every morning amble to their steel troughs and wait for food, hungry but hugely gentle. And the great ship destroyer sits, a jar of yellow oil in a bright museum in Salem where I saw myself recoil and gag at ancient rancid fat. We've drawn his mighty tooth and etched it with the memories of his efficient death. Deep is shallow, distant, close, the predator defended, the fierce incomprehensible, now fiercely comprehended. But in their looming disappearance, they're what they've always been, behemoth and leviathan, and chaos at the margin. And I'm going to end with a poem called Out. I read it to most of the classes today, not all. Um, the poem, as I explained um, to, 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 to the folks I talked to, it didn't happen to me. I took something else that had happened to me and projected it on um, my cousin. And the story is that um, my cousin's dog had fallen into the well and died. And um, my uncle, my aunt, my cousin, that was their drinking water. So my uncle's solution was to tie a rope around my cousin and lower him into the well where he had to grab um, his own dead dog and hold it while my uncle hauled him back to the surface. And I changed a few things in here. Um, I said it was a neighbor's dog. The, um, but anyway, this is a story little poem about that incident. It's simply called, Out. My father cinched the rope, a noose around my waist, and lured me into the darkness. I could taste my fear. It tasted first of dark, then earth, then rot. I swung and struck my head, and at that moment got another then then blood, which spiked my mouth with all iron. Hand over hand, my father dropped me from then to then, then water, then wet fur, which I hugged to my chest. I shouted, Daddy hauled the wet rope. I gagged and pressed my neighbor's missing dog against me. I held its death and rose up to my father, then light, 
then hands, then breath. Thank you very much. Um,